worship and to praise you. We've come for no other reason but to worship and to praise you, to give you glory and to give you honor. Father, we come at this time and we pray, Father God, that you would pull us close to you. Father God, help us to make it all about you. Speak to us on today and, and order our steps in your word. Father God, bless us that we would not leave this place the way that we come. Yes. Father God, anoint us afresh that we might hear from you. Yes. Continue to use us that we might uplift someone else. Continue to keep us focused that we might focus on you. Father, let us know that there is no problem, circumstance, situation that's greater than you. And now, Father, we pray that you would... Uh, be with me that you would help me to be your witness, that I would preach boldly for you, Father God. Use me for your glory. Pray that the words of my mouth be accepted in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And until the real preacher comes, uh, use me on today. Amen. 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 Now, uh, okay, let's try this one. Okay. All right. Is it on? Okay. Okay, I think we're good. As soon as I can get this here. Thank the Lord for that. I don't know, I'm too nervous to hold a mic today. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's much better. I, uh, you know, and I already feel like, I already feel like I need to give a disclaimer and confession today because um, uh, Reverend Newsom is so good at uh, doing the sports thing. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and he's always, you know, he can come up and he always has uh, something that's current yeah. uh, that he can weave into the sermon. Security. And 
And the name of this book was In the Belly of the Beast. Mm. In the Belly of the Beast. And he described the horrors of living in prison. Now, he was a very troubled person. He had started to get in trouble almost from the beginning. He got in trouble at 9. At 12, he was sent to long-term reform school. After that, he went to uh, prison, got out, went to prison, and had been in prison most of his life. So he described these horrors in these letters, and Norman Mailer published the book in 1981. He published the book in the belly of the beast. Now, and the book was published in 1981, and July 1981, July 19, 1981, the New York Times put out a praising review of this book. I mean, they just praised it to the height. Well, Norman Mailer had worked to get Jack Henry Abbott out of prison. Had a lot of celebrities on board, a lot of publicity. He was successful in getting him out. Got out about three months before July. July 19th. July 18th, July 19th, they wrote the report. July 18th, that night, Jack Henry Abbott and his friends went out to dinner in New York, East Village, 2nd Avenue, a restaurant called the Benny Bond. It was a small restaurant. So they had dinner, and Jack Henry Abbott, when they got ready to leave, Jack Henry Abbott asked if he could use the restroom. The waiter they had, young fellow who also was related to celebrities, told him that the, you have to go through the kitchen to get to the restroom. So patrons are not allowed to use the restroom. They got into an argument. They said, let's take it outside. They went outside, Jack Abbott stabbed the waiter to death. Mm -hmm. True story. Next day, this report came out about this book, how good it was. Jack Abbott fled, they eventually caught him, he was arrested and sent to prison for the rest of his life. Until and in 2002, he committed suicide mm. in prison. In the belly of the beast, described what it was like mm. to live in maximum security. Mm. Now I thought, that's a good description of what I want to talk about. <laughs> I, that, that, that's really going to be good. So I knew that Benny, or Tina, or Tamika would be looking right at me. <laughs> so I better know what belly of the beast means. Because chances are my sister in Arkansas is going to ask me, what did I mean by belly of the beast. So, I googled belly of the beast. And what I found out was that belly of the beast means, uh, from the online slang dictionary, means a dangerous place. From the urban dictionary online, it means to be locked up in the system, mm -hmm. to be in jail, the beast being the justice system. One definition said it's the feeling of feeling trapped. Mm -hmm. The biblical definition refers back to the time when Jonah 
was in the belly of the whale. And he prayed, and he felt like he was in the belly of the beast. It means you're surrounded by evil and you can't escape. Yeah. Yeah. It means you've been swallowed by the beast. You're feeling trapped and you don't feel like you can escape. Well, our scripture text today, Isaiah, the 40th chapter, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 11 and verses 28 through 31. So let me give you Isaiah 40. Is that there? Okay. Let's give out tech. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a good job. He's got to go. He's got a few maneuvers today to go through. Okay, so let me give you a little breakdown on the background before we move on. By most historical accounts, Isaiah was one of the considered one of the mightiest and best loved of the all of all the Old Testament prophets. His name was Isaiah ben Amos. And according to his own statement, he became in the prophetic ministry, the prophetic ministry in the year King Uzziah died. We've heard that before. But Isaiah 1.1 says, The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, when he, which he saw concerning Judah, and Jerusalem and the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. This would have been around 740, about 700 years before Christ. And Isaiah said, it was said in that year, the Lord touched, the angel of the Lord touched his lips with coal from the altar, and the Lord high and lifted up commissioned him to go to his people with the message of salvation and judgment. He was a prophet of all prophets, and what a prophet he was. Isaiah's calling as a prophet was primary, primarily to the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom, and to Jerusalem, and his mission and his purpose was to uh, uh, urge the people to repent of their sins and return to God. Many of his prophets predicted events that occurred in Isaiah's near future. Yet, at the same time, they foretold events that occurred, uh, that, that occurred some in his near future, some in his distant future, and some of Isaiah's prophets have not even happened yet because he prophesied in the end days. Isaiah was the prophet to prophesy that there would be a Messiah. For unto us a son is born, a savior would be born. Hundreds of years before it actually happened. The book of Isaiah is divided, it's uh, 66 chapters. The first 39 books contain messages of judgment. And the last 40 through 66, 27 verses focus on the captivity of Babylon, which is where we want to go today. The captivity of Babylon. This time, would the people of God would consider themselves trapped in the belly of the beast. But Isaiah addressed the captivity as a reality when it hadn't even happened yet. In other words, Isaiah prophesied, you're going to go through the belly of the beast, and the prophet had no idea when the captivity was going to be. That had to be God. Even though it was a hundred years after Isaiah died, before the captivity actually happened. Isaiah prophesied that it would happen. And Isaiah prophesied that the Assyrians' invasion 
would invade the nation, the city of Jerusalem would go up in flames, the Jewish temple would collapse, many people would be killed, the survivors would be forced to march 500 miles to refugee settlements, and they were going to be in exile for 70 years. 70 years in the belly of the beast. And then they would return to their homeland. So the latter chapters of Isaiah focuses on their return. See how the Spirit of God empowered this man of God. And he's actually as if he was actually there to write about what happened. So after being in exile, after going through the belly of the beast, they would forget the hymns, they would hang, hang their harps on willow trees, they would mourn the loss of the temple and their homeland. After having been taken in captivity by the Babylonians, then the Babylonians were captured by the Assyrians, then the Assyrians were taken over by the uh, Persian, Medes and Persians, and then they would be free. Ezra and Nehemiah tell the story of the, their return. And we've studied in Bible study how Nehemiah wanted to go back to build the wall around the temple because it was in rubble. And uh, so Nehemiah went back and built the wall in 52 days. So they had been held by the enemy. They're returning to rebuild their city that had been destroyed. We're going to pick out three things because we got to be out by 1230. Okay, three things from this beautiful passage of scripture. As God speaks through Isaiah, some of the most beautiful words that you ever hear. And look at how God provides for his people who's been in the belly of the beast. First thing we want to see, God provides everlasting comfort. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. Uh, chapter 40. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she shall receive from the Lord's hands double for all her sins. The prophet Isaiah was writing to the people of Israel during a time like us that they had concerns about the national news. The news for them was not too good. Again, the Assyrians, a constant threat was breathing, breathing down their necks. Later it would be the Babylonians who would take them all away and live in exile. And as they thought about all this stuff that was happening around them, they were overcome by the gravity of it all. They needed some biblical comfort. Comfort uh, that says your warfare is <coughs> over. Your sins have been pardoned. And when we know that we've been forgiven, that produces comfort within us. We can trust God because he's taken our sins away. He's taken that guilt and that burden away and we can receive comfort. Yeah. Look at all this bad stuff that's happening all around us. We're trapped in this horrible mess. All of this evil going on. The Lord says, comfort ye. Comfort. Yeah. Yes, comfort my people. Your fighting is over. Your warfare is over. You don't have to fight anymore. God gives us everlasting comfort. 
And just like Isaiah speaking into the life of the Jewish people, Jesus comes to speak comfort to us and to our messed up world and to our situations that no matter how hopeless it looks, he wants to speak a word of comfort Amen. in your situation. God gives everlasting comfort through his son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, we ought to be able to give some comforting words. We ought to be able, when things are messed up, we can bring calm. And a, a comforting word can de-escalate the situation. We ought to be able to give comforting words. God is able to calm things, the word of God. Yeah. Or are we one of the people that say, oh yeah, things are in a mess. Mm -hmm. Or can we bring comfort mm -hmm. to our world today? Not only is God's word comforting, but God's word is number two, everlasting. Yeah. Look at the verses seven and eight. It says the grass withers, the flowers fade, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flowers will fade, but the word of God stands forever. My sisters and brothers, we can question many things. We can question the security of our nation, we can question the security of, of sometimes our relationships. We can question the security of many things. But we cannot question the security of God's word. God's word will stand forever. Amen. And you can stand on the word of God. <laughs> this is the God that we're talking about. We can be confident in his words, purely because they are God's words. This is the God in whom all things hold together. This is the God who spoke in the person of Jesus Christ, spoke and the storm was still, spoke and changed water into wine, spoke and the blind received sight, who promised that he'd send his Holy Spirit to empower us and that we would do greater things you, than he did. You, you can stand on the word of God. Yes. And if he said it, if it's in his word, it's true, whether you believe it or not. Yes. Whether you agree with it or not. Yes. It's true. Yes. You don't have to agree with it for it to be true. It's the word of God. He says flowers will fade, but the word of God is everlasting. Yes. The word of God is the only thing that is living and active. The Bible says it's a two-edged sword, piercing as it divides the soul. It's able to judge the thoughts. We have to believe that the word of God will accomplish what God said it will accomplish. Yes, yes, yes. Thank God. Where it says, in Isaiah, so shall my word that goes out from my mouth, it shall not, it shall not return to me empty, but it will accomplish the purpose that I set it out for. Yes. Yeah. Everlasting comfort, he brings everlasting word. You can stand on the word of God. Yeah. You can stake, you can draw the line in the sand on the word of God. He brings everlasting comfort. He brings an everlasting word. And then he brings everlasting strength. Look at verses 29 through 31. It reads, 
He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases <coughs> strength. That's a beautiful promise right there. Yeah. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. My sisters and brothers, the people of God needed some strength. They needed some strong encouragement. They had been trapped in exile, and they felt like all their strength was gone. God says, I'll give you some everlasting strength. Strength that will keep on, keeping on. Yes. Well, I want to actually close with this story, but i got a little ways to go. I want to close with the story of the eagle. Now, the eagle is an interesting and majestic bird. And the eagle has remarkable vision. Scientists say that the eagle's vision is eight times greater than a human. Their eyes are larger than human eyes. And they can see far greater and far better than we can. They can see a salmon in the water and swoop down and get it and have salmon baked for dinner. <laughs> it is said that the eagle has telescopic vision, the kind of vision that is attributed to superheroes. The eagle has strong feet with talons, those nail things, that can grip like a vice grip. Their beaks are as sharp as a butcher's knife, designed to cut and to tear their food. But most of all, the eagle is built for flying. They can soar at incredible speeds, speeds of 60, 80, and even 100 miles an hour. They can loop and dive and uh, uh, flip and do roll like a stunt plane. They can do all of that. And their wingspan is eight feet wide. When you see a robin or a hummingbird uh, or uh, a sparrow, Flying, you see them flapping their wings. Well, an eagle don't do that. You see, God created our planet with these invisible columns of air coming up from it. And they are called thermals or updrafts. Have you been in a, ever been in a strong wind and it's kind of pushing you back? Remember last year they had to close school because the wind was going to be so strong. It was going to blow the little kids away. <laughs> but winds can be strong. And these thermals that come up from the, air, from the earth, all over the earth, well, eagles know how to find these thermals, updraft, and, and stretch out their wings and catch an updraft and soar without even flapping their wings. They can be lifted as high as 15,000 feet on an uptrack. So far, the naked eye can't even see them. And when they reach those heights, they get up there, and they are <coughs> flying. They use these thermals, and they're soaring way and that way 
use it to gain height yeah. and to soar. They use the upgrade. Hence my title. We gotta be like the eagle. We gotta use those things that will potentially hold us back to help us soar. We gotta use the upgrade of the job loss to help us soar. We gotta use the divorce to help us soar. We gotta use the diagnosis to help us soar. We gotta be like the eagle. Don't go flapping around, <laughs> fluttering around in your own strength. Use the upgrade right. of God's word. Amen. Find strength in him and wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And he will strengthen your heart. Don't flap around, don't get all discombobulated. Struggle in your own strength. Use the updraft. That's right. My sisters and brothers, we got to be like eagles. We got to use those things that will potentially destroy us and take us down to soar. Use the updraft. You might feel like you're in the belly of a beast. But God offers everlasting comfort. Yes. He offers his everlasting word. Yes. And he offers everlasting strength. Look to heaven. Stretch out on the wings of prayer. And praise and become like eagles. And so use the updraft. Things that are trying to trap you and bind you, and destroy you, and discourage you. Use them as updraft yeah. Yeah. and soar. Yeah. Don't try to go forth in your own strength. Yeah. We'll faint and utterly fall. But when we have our hope in Jesus Christ, yeah. our hope in heaven will be carried above our difficulty. Yeah and being able to lay hold of the prize mm -hmm. of the high calling. There's a strength, my sisters and brothers, that comes from God. Yes. It's an everlasting strength, mm -hmm. an everlasting comfort, and an everlasting truth mm -hmm. from an everlasting God. Mm -hmm. The best thing we can do is live out the realities of God's faithfulness mm -hmm. as we model it in our lives. Use those things that would hold us back yeah. to push us forth yeah. and soar. Yeah. We can be living examples, living sources of comfort, living proof of the reliability of God's word, living examples of strength that come from God. We can mount up with wings like eagles and be like Ethel. My God, my God. Be like eagles and soar. Let us soar. Amen. 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 Let us all stand.